Hello YouTubers, welcome back to the Holtz Mitchell channel. Today we're going to be talking about uh, the uh, monitoring process and the drying. Now you've got your wood stacked and uh, all stickered up and uh, covered up. Now it's set and ready to go. Now what you want to do um, in your stack is find a sacrificial board, if you will, uh, to be the guinea pig uh, for the drying process. And we're going to, today we're also going to talk about uh, moisture meters and that kind of thing because that is an integral part of monitoring so um, we'll be taking a look at those here in a second. Anyway, I got this board here uh, as, a, as a guinea pig so to speak uh, for today's experiment. The other uh, device that you can use uh, for monitoring is a uh, letter scale and uh, I'll show you how you can use the letter scale to monitor your wood here in a second. <coughs> this is where your sacrificial board comes in. Um, if you insert probes, of course you're going to have uh, little holes in the in the wood, uh, so you're going to have to watch out for that to make sure you get a board that uh, you can do that with. Otherwise, if you're dependent on uh, all the wood that you have in your stack, um, yeah, the the uh, the holes that you generate with the uh, with the monitor with the uh, with the pins, sorry, um, will be a problem. With one of these cheap little um, letter scales, like this, electronic five dollar wonders. They just have to be accurate to about um, a tenth of a gram. So what we're going to do here is. Uh, we're going to cut into our sacrificial board. And so what you want here is uh, little chunks out of your board, cross-sectional pieces, fairly thin, eighth to a quarter an inch thick, doesn't really matter. Um, the thicker ones take a little longer to dry. Now what you're going to do with this is this is your, your, your uh, monitoring sample and you'll be making these uh, periodically if you use this, me if you use this method. Um, you'll be using this about once a week. Uh, so that's why you're going to have a sacrificial board that you can cut up into little pieces, you know, or a portion of it anyway. And so what you do is you lay these on your letter scale, you know, like, like this, and you weigh them out. Oops, got to tear it out first. Okay, so now we've got 38 grams. Now, what you'd want to do is put these in a dry spot. Uh, you can put them in your oven at, uh, you know, re real low temperature. I don't know how low your oven will go, uh, but you got to stick around for it. You can't just drop them in there and walk away because sooner or later you're going to have smoke rolling out of it. Um, or in the microwave, 
Best thing to do is lay them on top of a radiator or someplace really dry, you know, your furnace or something like that in the house in a little tray uh, so that these can dry out completely. You want to get them down to zero percent if you can. And the reason you know that, um, if you have any idea how much volume you have, you can kind of figure it out mathematically uh, by the density of the wood. Now keep in mind the uh, density formulas or the density tables of wood uh, that you can find in the internet are kind of based on um, average values. So each tree, depending on where it's growing at, will show a little different, <coughs> little different number in density. So anyway, um, take your, your wet weight, and then you dry these, like I say, you dry these out and then uh, you weigh them again after they're done drying, you know, usually about two days um, on, the, on a radiator or in a, on top of a furnace. About two hours maximum is what you should put them in, a, in an oven for and, you know, microwave, you're just going to have to play around with it because every microwave is a little different. And so then you weigh that. So then you take your dry weight and divide it by your wet weight, multiply it by 100, and then you have your moisture content. And you do that fairly regularly, like I say, about one week intervals, depending on how fast your wood is drying. If it's drying fairly slow, if you're in a high humidity area, you know, uh, and you, you know it's gonna take up to six months to dry, you know, once a month is fine. Um, just depends on, you know, how, how often you wanted uh, to check on it. So um, that's basically all there is to uh, the monitoring uh, as far as that goes. Now, so let's uh, take a look here at uh, the various moisture meters. Let's see, oops, forgot the other one. This is a typical touch to the wood type. Here's the shoe that uh, it comes in contact with the wood. Then you have your LCD display here and uh, the different settings that you can put in uh, for the different species of wood. So, and this works in this way. Let's see. Get this old board here. and. Uh, Let's see if we can see that. So this is shown 18.4%. So <clears throat> keep in mind that uh, with these moisture meters, there is going to be a variance. Um, not all of them read the same. And uh, with the cheap Chinese ones, uh, about all you can hope for is a ballpark figure. Uh, you can pick them up on eBay for you know, 30, 35 bucks. <clears throat> Uh, believe it or not, the letter scale is going to be the most accurate way of doing that. And here we have a uh, pin type moisture meter. And uh, we'll hook the probe up here to it. And then it has a slide hammer with these pins and the contacts. Now you don't have to drive the pins in all the way. Some of them are, you know, they're usually a lot shorter. Um, this is just an extra long one. Um, these use resistance in the board to measure the moisture. So what you do with these is uh, take your slide hammer and then we measure this. And we have a measurement of 16.7, 16.6 16 just to show you. Oops. No. There's something going on here. It just showed 16.7, so. Must have pulled one of the. Let's try that again. Batteries must be getting dead or something. No, no, we got the wrong temperature setting. Let's take it down to the right one. Yeah. 
still showing 2.5. That's just not right. That cannot be right. Okay, something is amiss with this guy. <coughs> Nope, still 2.3. I know this board is a lot wetter than 2.3%. Anyway, um, this is the pin type meter. Uh, these are generally a little more accurate than the uh, surface type. Um, so if you get one, you know, the like I said, the, the little $35 cheapies from in eBay from China, um, you get what you pay for. Those things, they work to a degree, but they are no kind of accurate. Now another uh, device the guy can invest in if you're doing a lot of drying in the house is one of these hygrometers. Now this is a uh, one uh, hygrometer that monitors relative uh, humidity over here, uh, temperature here, and this curve then shows what the uh, wood moisture should be. Now when you get in here close you can see where it shears you should be at about a seven percent uh, wood moisture rating at uh, the current temperature and relative humidity. Now what you can also do is get uh, some mercury or alcohol um, thermometers, just the little bulb thermometers, and a piece of gauze, and then uh, make a wet bulb, dry bulb type thermometer. That uh, is called a psychrometer, and that too can be used to monitor uh, the relative humidity. There are formulas for it. Um, I won't include them just yet, or I'll try and see if I can dig them up online. If I can't, then uh, we'll forego that. But uh, anyway, this is. Um, one of the other devices you should uh, consider if you're doing a lot of indoor drying, uh, especially if uh, you need to monitor the uh, moisture in the house because when you bring in a lot of wood uh, to your house that's 20%, between 15 and 20%, you will get a noticeable increase in the relative humidity in the house. So you got to keep that in, in mind and then keep an eye on it so you don't get mold development um, in those rooms where you're uh, storing your wood. When you move your wood indoors, um, after it reaches, uh, say, a moisture content of less than 20%, anything over 20%, you want to keep it outside and air dry it. Um, keep in mind that depending on where you're at in the world, um, where I used to live at in Oak City, Idaho, um, I stacked my wood to the prevailing winds at a slight, a <clears throat> a slight angle, and I achieved after about three years of drying, um, I mean, it sounds kind of crazy, it was two by fours and two by sixes, I, I didn't really have anything planned for them at the time when they were milled, so I just stacked them up and stickered them. Um, I had moisture contents in there, believe it or not, of between eight and nine percent. So it can get fairly low if you stack them up right and let it just chooch for, you know, however long you want to make it, let it, let it go for. <clears throat> now, the reason I say 20%, um, at that moisture content, you're still going to get mold development. And there's still plenty of wood or moisture in the wood fiber, so you got to make sure that you get that out before you move your wood indoors. Um, it's basically uh, the difference, you know, I mean, you're using your house essentially as a kiln. Um, so, you know, when you move that wood indoors, now you've got an energy investment into it, and so you want to make sure that you maximize that energy investment or have to put as little energy into the drying the wood as you possibly can. Let nature do the work for you. Um, we'll take a look at uh, some, some stacks in later on. Uh, you know, for your indoors. Um, the construction indoors is essentially the same as it is outdoors. Um, you just, you know, put it in a dry area. Now, when you stack indoors, um, 
you got to do one. You got to do several things. One is you got to put a fan on it. You, you got to have artificial air movement because the the air in your house is is pretty stagnant, and the convection that you get just isn't enough to turn it over. Um, now, if you stack it in the basement, you're still going to have some moisture issues. So make sure that you stay high enough off off the floor and far enough away from the wall, and get a good enough air circulation to where. Uh, mold development and uh, circulation issues don't become a problem. Um, if you stick it in the attic, believe it or not, you don't really have to have much air moisture uh, air movement going on in the attic. Um, attics are naturally dry just by the sun beating down on them, so you're going to end up with very very low uh, moisture content in your wood when the process when the when the whole thing is done drying. So. Attic is good, basement, nee, stay away from it if you can. Now, the other thing about uh, bringing your wood indoors, say you want to lay um, a tongue and groove floor. Um, you've got your stuff, you know, you bought it at the, the local uh, building supply outfit, and now you're going to put down your parquet flooring. The thing you want to do, make sure you let, allow it to acclimate. And that means you bring it into the room where it's going to be laid open the packages up, let them air out real good, and let them sit for about three weeks. Um, it sounds time intense, I know, but uh, you, you really should do that for the simple fact it allows the wood to uh, equalize because not every board in your packet is going to be the same moisture. And so by opening up the packet, scattering it around, and allowing the wood to equalize will make sure that your floor doesn't buckle or warp or shrink um, you know, wood is a natural product, so you know the the old German saying goes that you know the difference between a uh, between wood and a bureaucrat is that wood works always. So you want to make sure that that uh, that wood is equalized and uh, doesn't start working on you and shrinking or swelling. So anyway. So the uh, monitoring is pretty well just straightforward, uh, just watching it and, you know, um, if you have to have a time frame, of course, you know, there's always the option of a dry kiln. Um, we'll look at some of those at the end of this series probably. Uh, for the average homeowner, you could probably get away with using like a, a solar dry kiln. Um, those are fairly easy to make. You can make those with a couple of sticks and, uh, and uh, some VizQueen essentially. It doesn't really take much to make a, dry, a solar dry kiln. Um, there's some other guys in, in YouTube that have uh, models of, of uh, solar dry kilns and th those work really good but you know that's for something more permanent. You know if, if a guy's only going to be making uh, you know a table or something like that or a few you know pieces of furniture um, the investment really isn't worth it in the long haul to have a kiln sitting there all the time and then having it sit empty. Now if you're going to be doing a lot of wood or doing it commercially then yes I would recommend you set up a small kiln or a solar kiln uh, somehow that you can uh, dry wood in commercial quantities that you can work with. So anyway that's uh, the episode for today on monitoring. Hope that helps you out. Um, if I forgot anything, let me know in the comment section below. Any contribution is always welcome. And uh, hope to see you soon.